Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Black Baseball Mixtape. I am your host, Cheats. As always, the mixtape is brought to you by the Family Podcast Network. I am so excited because, as we mentioned on the last couple of episodes, we are now cracking the top 100 every once in a while. Every once in a while, we're cracking the top 100 under the baseball category and Apple Podcasts. It's all because of you, and it's all because you rate, review, and subscribe, and tell a friend about the podcast. So if you keep doing that, we will be elevating Black Baseball. We will continue to do so. And let me say, if we can't get in the top 100 with this episode, with this guest, I don't know what we're doing. I don't (laughs) know what we're doing because we have another person off our 2023 dream list None other than the chief baseball development officer of all of Major League Baseball. Oh, and by the way, he honeymoons as the general manager of Team USA as we're going into the World Baseball Classic. None other than Tony Regans. Mr. Regans, welcome to the mixtape. Chiefs, man. Glad to be here, man. Glad to be a part of this. Um, Congratulations on your success. Hey, you know, we did not go through your background right now in the intro. Because it is too lengthy, you have done too many things in the in the world of baseball. We're going to get into some of that, but let me ask you: You are in a very small club, and that small club is of African American general managers in Major League Baseball. I believe you were either number four or number five when you took the job with the uh, with the Angels, and now as we go into the 2023 season, we have. Another, a new member of that club, Dana Brown, was hired just recently by the Houston Astros to take over that program. When you hear news like that, when you know that there's another person in the club, and I'm sure you're very familiar with Mr. Brown, uh, Mr. Brown, how does that make you feel? How do you reflect on on hearing things like that? And, and what's the first thing you do? Do you give them a call and be like, hey, welcome to the club? No, I didn't. Actually, I didn't give him a call because I thought, I mean, I've known Dana for many, many years capable, um, first and foremost. So I just don't think he was handed the job, which is which is really important. I mean, he's a capable evaluator, um, capable human being. Um, his his skill set is is perfect for for that club. Uh, I think there's some good people around him. I think you need that. Dusty being there, I mean Dusty will be an advocate for for Dana. Um, so I think that uh, this is a great opportunity for him to really grow in, in the role, make an impact because they have a really good club. And and number and number three, I think be a and it was for, it was like that for me, be a role model for other young African American men and women um, to obtain to be a leader of a baseball club. Um, uh, as, if you were like me when I was growing up, I didn't even think it was possible. Mm. I didn't think that um, I would ever have an opportunity to do what I was able to do. And um, to see a face that looks like mine or a face that looks like yours uh, at the uh, leadership role of a major league club, you know, it, it's number one, it's cool for, for, for so, so cool. First and foremost, number number two, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that because um, folks are looking at what you do, how you how you carry yourself, how you communicate, how you walk. Um, you know, your life is, is not your own in that role. It uh, is definitely um, you're being evaluated all the time. Everything you say, every word that you say um, is being evaluated. And um I know Dana's going to do a good job because he's he's a smart guy. Um, his baseball knowledge is, you know, right there with with some of the best in the game, and uh, the people around him are good folks. So um, I'm confident that he'll do a good job, and he's got a good club. Knowing what you know now, because you learn something new every day. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give? Not just Mr. Brown, but anyone that is going to be elevated to the position of running a major league ball club. There's so many young executives that are working in a front office somewhere, 
whether it's a scouting department, an analytics department, and their goal is to ultimately be general manager. What advice do you give them? Prepare yourself for the opportunity. Um, and that preparation can start 10 years from now. Um, but prepare yourself from the, from for the opportunity. And when that opportunity presents itself, grasp it, right? Don't don't hesitate, take it. But you have to prepare um, for the role. And when you're in the role, it's a lot different than what you think. Mm. Uh, and, and I would say you have to have thick skin, you have to trust your abilities, and you have to have good people around you. And I really believe that what is important is that you have to have the belief that you can do the job because the preparation led you to this place, to this moment. And um, I felt for me, I was I was I was younger in the game um, at that time. And uh, come, come on now, you know, <laughs> you're I'm looking at you now. You're not that old. You're not that old, Mr. Regis. Come on now. But that preparation. I, I grew into the role. I grew into the role. I learned how to negotiate. Um, I, I, I mean, I thought I could negotiate, but you, you'll come into situations where, where you know that part of it is really important. Dealing with media is really important, and then just your baseball um, knowledge and IQ is really important. And a lot of times in this role. Most people think I get to put the club together and that's all I need to I need to do. But there's, you know, the financial piece, mm. you know, ownership piece, all of your employees that report to you. And how you relate to people is important and how you treat people is important. I, and I always say, you know, you treat people like you want to be treated. And at the end of the day, you be fair. And if you're fair and you're and you're straight up and you tell you tell the truth, uh, whether it hurts or not, then you can, at the end of the day, you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I did the best that I can I, or, or I could. And I, I treated people fair. I did the right thing. And um, you have to, you have to roll with the punches because things are going to happen. Uh, things are going to happen. You're going, you're going to face adversity. No question about it. Um, sometimes you're going to face some uncomfortable situation, but how you handle those situations and, and, um, your professionalism will always shine through. And so that's what I would tell young people, just to be prepared, be prepared. And if this is something that you really want to do, take the time to do the research, mm. do the, do the, do the tough work. Cause a lot of times people want to come in the game, especially in this, this, this age, this day and age that they want to come in and come right to the top. Um, they want, you know, I want to make six figures right away. Mm -hmm. And, um, I started as an intern working for free and I, and I worked my way up. I learned, you know, over the course of 17 years, I get that opportunity to run the angels uh, for 17 years. But along the way, I wouldn't change a thing for, for the journey because um, I learned so much. I learned how to, to deal with folks. I learned, I watched, I mean, and that's another important thing. I watched folks. Um, I watched people that did it well. I, I watched folks that I thought, didn't didn't handle situations a certain way. Mm -hmm. So with that that growth and that learning, I was able to kind of shape my philosophy. Um, when I got the, the the general manager's job, I had a way of doing business that I really didn't change from when I was a farm director. You know, it was just the same type of mentality. The only difference was the players were a lot better, obviously, and the money was a lot bigger. So the contracts were <laughs> the negotiations were a little bit tougher. Just a no little doubt. bit tougher. No let me let me fast forward because this is really important information. Let me fast forward to your role now at Team USA as a general manager of this club. I want to ask what experience experiences from the 17 years and the time that you spent as a general manager previously, because it's not the same operation, but how did you apply your experience from previous roles in ML MLB to this particular specific role of leading Team USA with all of these really, really amazing players in this international competition? Sure. Uh, I started with getting people around me that I trust and that 
that I knew were very, very capable. I felt diversity was very important. Um, you know, I hired Mark DeRosa as a manager. And then I thought it was important because Mark had never been, he's never been in, never in been, a dugout. He's never been a major league manager before, yeah. And so I thought Jerry Manuel, who I have a great relationship, trust him, his baseball knowledge, his IQ is off the charts, um, would be a nice compliment to d -Row. And then I filled the staff out with a bunch of talented uh, players and former players and, and, and coaches that, you know, I know will, number one, be able to relate and communicate to the caliber of players that we have. And so how I relate my my role today um, with the role that I had with, with the Angels is your communication style, right? I um, I felt that I communicated really well back then, and it's much easier now because now I have a, a position where I've been around the game, uh, players, the, the coaches, they know my history. They know what I've done in the game. And so being able to build a, a unit that's going to work together uh, for one common goal, our goal is to win the WBC. And when I was talking to each one of our coaching staffs and, and, and the players, it was all about that. It was about winning um, for Team USA and, and the USA across our chest. And so when you have a common goal, the egos and these guys, these are big names. I mean, I, you, you know, the I, biggest in the game. I got Junior here, King Griffey Jr.'s here, Andy Pettit. You know, these guys are these guys are here rowing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the the players, you know, my first conversation day one, I think I I I took over um at the end of June. First uh, order of business was to get Mike Trout to be a part of it. And, um, you know, me having a relationship with, with, with Mike in 2009, when we, when we drafted him, I went to um, Angel Stadium before the All-Star game and I met with him and just asked him if he wanted to be a part of it. And he was like, I'm in. Mm -hmm. And so from that, it was just a groundswell of interest. I mean, he people started contacting him. More people started contacting <laughs> me, and, um, and so it wasn't. It a lot of, It wasn't a lot of push and pull, like trying to, you know, convince guys to be a part of this. It was more like I want to be a part of this. Um, you know, Mookie talked about he wanted to play next to Trout. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Brian, Bryce Harper, who unfortunately got uh, you know had surgery and can't mm -hmm. participate, but Harper was like he wanted to play with Trout. Mm -hmm. And so um, being able to put the team together, uh, d Row has been, uh, Mark DeRosa has been awesome in terms of he knows so many players and so many coaches and executives in the game. Having my initial conversation with players and then him following up and, and, and really um, digging deeper into the relationships um, knowing more about the players, about the, the 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 coaches that we have to report to at the end of this, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's it's really been fun. It, this is a lot easier than running a club for me because you don't have to worry about the uh, the finances, right? Right, you don't have to negotiate those tough <laughs> those tough there's, contracts, right? There's no no negotiations. I mean, that's awesome. Kind of have like uh, unlimited budget, but. <laughs> The one thing that you do have to be mindful of, though, you have a responsibility to these organizations to get these guys back healthy. Yeah. And so first and foremost, that's our priority. Number two, uh, we, we obviously want to win, but we want these guys to get back healthy. And um, we want this this to be a first class experience. A lot of guys on the team have talked about that have been in the, the WBC before talked about like this being the best baseball experience in their life. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear that type of feedback, we want that to we want them to walk away with that same type of feeling um, the way this camp is set up you know I've talked to to D-Row a lot about that you know I want a professional camp um, I want players knowing where they need to be when they need to be I don't want anybody guessing where they need to be because that's what, what I did when I was with the Angels and so we talk about how I'm carrying over what I did with the Angels and mm -hmm. what I what I do today 
professional camp is really important. And so um, if a player walks through the door and things aren't right, you know, it may not be viewed as, as important. But if things come in and things are down to the minute and they know exactly where they need to be, when they need to be, any question that they have, we have the answers. They feel that this is important to us as a as a staff. And so then, you know, my hope is that they just fall in line from there. Um, we've had great conversations with each one of them. And, um, you know, I, I've, you know, in this job, you have to have conversations with the player, mm-hmm. the coaches, um, the players, coaches, the agents. <laughs> and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of yeah. phone calls. So, but, you know, it's all good. It's all good because, again, you know, we have one goal, one goal and one goal only, and that's to win. And, um, you know, we're not even picked to win this thing right now. So uh, we got a little chip on our shoulder. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of good teams. There there's are. a lot there of are. good teams. What you're mentioning, though, are the little details that change good to great. And when you're talking about the best players in the world, you're talking about amazing organization and the best organizations and the way that they're run. You're talking about doing every little thing to make sure that the communication's on to point, make sure the camp is run solid, make sure they need, you know, they have everything they need so they can get that peak performance. So that, and that's, I think what that level, those caliber of players, they expect nothing less, right? They're major leaguers and you guys, you guys are all major leaguers as well. You mentioned the importance of diversity in the diversifying your staff. You mentioned Jerry Manuel, King Griffey Jr., great, great people around. One of the things as a fan that gets me excited is when I look at the diversity of the team. And what I mean by that is you mentioned Mookie Betts is playing, Tim Anderson is playing, Cedric Mullins is playing. And it's just so exciting to have so many (laughs) Devin Williams is playing. So to have people that we can root for in every pocket of baseball is exciting. Was that something that just came organically or was that something that was important to the organization to make sure that the team has diversity in it? It was important to me in terms of these players that were were African-American players were some of the best players in the world. Right. And, you know, Cedric, you know, quiet guy, but man, he, um, he, very, very talented. You know, Mookie obviously is Mookie. Mookie's one of the best players in the world. Absolutely. Kevin, you know, nasty. Um, you love to have him at the back end of your ball game um, in, a, in, a, in a tough situation. You'd love to have him. And so when you look at at the player, um, they are some of the best players in the world. So they deserve the opportunity to be on this club. So I didn't want to um, – not consider them right mm. if they if they their talent level spoke to what we're trying to accomplish then um i wanted them to be a part of it so when i looked at the whole picture of it i was like these guys are some of the best players in the world and they want to play they want to be a part of this let's do it ta ta was awesome and mm-hmm. he, TA was like i'll do whatever you want me to do i want to be a part of it that's and, so, and this guy and, and you know ta is an everyday shortstop at the mm-hmm. you know for the white Sox, and he was like whatever you need me to do um i'm uh, i'm in and so easy conversation with ta he just wants to be a part of it one of number seven uh <laughs> which was cool because <laughs> uh, we at that time we had about three number sevens uh, but uh oh geez uh, it was uh it was it was cool to, to hear ta and him you know wanting to be a part of this that, and that's got to make all of us, especially baseball fans, feel just so excited about the World Baseball Classic because we talk about it in terms of it being almost, you know, the World Cup, if you will, of baseball. We know how global and how important and how much national pride uh, people take in the World Cup. I think it's very similar when we talk to the World Baseball Classic. It's not like that in 2023 in every sport. So in every sport, and we know in 92, we had the dream team, if you will. And then we had dream team two and possibly there wouldn't have been a need for a redeemed team. If everybody was, (laughs) if everybody was actively participating and actively playing. So there are times where it's difficult to get the best players in the world 
to play. You mentioned you started with Mike Trout, and that made things a lot easier. But it, it's got to be exciting for everyone involved in Team USA to know, one, these games are going to be extremely competitive. The environment is going to be like nothing we're ever used to outside of maybe an international soccer frenzy type thing. So they're going to be playing in front of, you know, some amazing fans, amazing support. Uh, and you just mentioned it as well. Not only do we have some of the best players in the world, we're playing some of the best teams in the world. How do you prepare to take on all of those challenges for the World Baseball Classic? Because they all seem like good problems, but it's it's, it's going to be awesome. It really is going to be a great tournament. Um, we have Team USA on our chest. We have those three letters across our chest. And every single team is going to be trying to beat us. They're going to throw their best pitchers against us. Mm -hmm. um, and we expect that. And they're going to be trying to beat Team USA because, you know, we are who we are. So we're going to, be at, we're going to have to be at the top of our games uh, every single night. Um, even the teams that, you know, quote, unquote, maybe perceived as lesser teams, they're going to be pumped up to play uh, Team USA. Absolutely. And all you have to do is, and it's not that simple, but if you have a hot pitcher at the right time and, you know, that pitcher is, is dealing and, and, you know, your bats might be a little slow, you know, a bad bounce, uh, a bloop double, um, a, a pass ball. Um, uh, a, a a pitch, a, a a ground ball thrown away uh, down the line may change the whole game, right? Might Absolutely. change the whole tournament for 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 any team. So we have to be on top of our game, and I think that these guys will be prepared uh, because our coaching staff is, you know, they they they're they're outstanding. They're prepared, and you know, I think I led off by saying preparation is important. Mm -hmm. When you prepare, things don't surprise you, right? Um, when you're not prepared, the ability to get surprised uh, becomes a little bit more more frequent. So um, I believe that this this coaching staff will get these guys uh, in in the in the right frame of mind. Um, and I can tell you this that you know Mark DeRosa has never done it; he's never managed. Uh, but in terms of preparation, I mean, I, I've talked to him three four times a week, and every time that I've talked to him, he's He's talking about lineups, you know, pitching, you know, who's going to pitch in this situation. I mean, he's depth charts. Every he's consumed by it. So, I mean, we're looking at from looking at it from an athletic standpoint, from an old school baseball standpoint, from an analytical standpoint, from a new school standpoint. We're looking at it like in all these different shapes and forms and coming up with nice conversations around who should do this in this situation, who should be playing defense for us in this situation, who should be on the mound starting a game for us. So the preparation, I have no, no, um, no hesitation that we will be ready and prepared to play the game. Obviously you got to go out there and play nine each night and, yep. uh, and, and, and execute. But um, in terms of preparation, I think we're there. I'm excited for it. I know the fans around the game are excited for it. It's going to be very special out in Arizona, but I can't wait till Miami. And I don't want to look ahead. I don't want to look ahead, but it's going to be special out in Arizona. But if we do, we take care of business like we need to take care of business and we get down to Miami, whoo, it's going to, it's going to be a scene like no other. I'm very excited about it. You, I guess your one of your challenges is going to have to be make sure you keep the players it, it, you look inside. You got to get to keep them inside. <laughs> you know, I'm not even worried about. Uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. These guys, but they're they are, like I said, they're the best in the world for a reason, right? Absolutely. They, they just Absolutely. are, and you know they they. You know, I think Bobby Witt is our youngest guy, and I've I've been around Bobby for a long time as as a high schooler, mm -hmm. and have a ton of respect for him as the youngest guy. He. I think this is just going to be such a springboard for his career mm -hmm. in terms of being able to be around this caliber and this group of players and then this coaching staff. I, I uh, and I talked to uh, JJ about that and, and Bobby's dad. I think that this is, this is going to be really important for him because he's going to have a chance to, to, to learn, to ask questions, to be around some of the best to ever do it. 
I mean, you got, obviously you have Junior there that uh, yep. is probably considered, you know, one of the best to ever do it. Absolutely. And to, to, to feed and learn off of those guys and watch how they prepare. It's going to be it's going to be fun. And then Trouder is going to be who he is um, and, and hasn't had a chance to be on this type of stage yet in his career. Um, I think it's going to be fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, I think everyone's looking forward to it. We're so excited. And it's here. But ladies and gentlemen, when you listen to this, it's it's gonna it's time to play. He's he's very Tony's very calm and collected right now, but it is <laughs> it is time to go. Let, let me switch gears and ask you about your role as chief baseball development officer. I mean, as somebody that's following all of the development efforts for major league baseball and seeing honestly how they've just picked up and picked up and pick, it seems like you're adding new things every year to get young people, uh, African-Americans, exciting uh, activities for them not only to play the game, but to get scouted, get put in the draft. Well, there's just so much that's going on in the development office that I'm excited, like that I'm excited about. I say that with saying this caveat, now, you probably, you're laughing, so you probably know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Does the development office get enough? I don't know if credit is the word, but is there enough awareness around the Andre Dawson classic, the dream series, all the things, the new coming up this year, it's the Swingman classic that you mentioned, Ken Griffey Jr. You're doing all of these things. And I do know because I'm out in the streets, <laughs> I hear Major League Baseball has to do more. Major League Baseball has to do more. Major League ba and I'm not. I'm one of those people. I was one of those people without not necessarily knowing all the efforts that we put in to date saying, well, hey, look, we got, you know, I'm looking around my neighborhood. We got we got to do more. How do you how do you raise awareness or is there enough awareness for the things that you are doing? And then how, you know, how do you kind of almost process that, move the ball forward and in, in the position that you have? No, I think that's a great Great question. Um, I don't think we're doing, I don't think the awareness is there that we need it and need to have. And, you know, that's partly on us and as a, as a institution being major league baseball is getting that awareness out there. I think we're doing much better at that now. Um, but the programs that we have, we've added since I've been in the commissioner's office, 2015, we've added 26, new exactly. programs um, Wow, that um, probably most people don't know about. Um, and that's probably where we fall short because things are happening. And mm -hmm. at your point to the Andre Dawson Classic, we just finished that up uh, yep. a couple of weeks, a week ago, a week and a half ago. And when I was at, when I came to the commissioner's office, we had three players um, in that tournament. HBCU tournament three. Uh, last week, last week we had forty five players in that tournament that came through our development programs. So when and so these are African American players playing at HBCUs, mm -hmm. which is which is really important. But to answer your question, is we need to do more from a awareness standpoint, and doing things like like your your podcast today is is a piece of that because I think that. Um, the more that we can educate uh, folks to what is actually taking place at the commissioner's office, um, what the programs are, you know, I'm a guy that I try to stay behind the scenes and, and it's not really important for me to know my name, but just to know my work. And um, I really, <laughs> well, well, important. I, 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 really love, I love when humble people say that, but it's well, well, important, man. But I really believe that if we can, bring awareness to some of these programs because they're creating like waves and waves of talent. I mean, all of those guys that, you know, went in last year's draft, they, we, you know, we touched them at some point, multiple organizations and people, individuals have touched them, but we had um, a significant part, you know, in their development and in their, in their growth as players. Um, but the draft is, is just one piece. I, I started an initiative, our play ball initiative in 2015. And a big part of that initiative, play ball is about getting out in the community and just playing baseball and softball and not, you know, 18 players on a field and an umpire and 
you know, scoreboard. It's just about going out and playing. And so what I started was I, I said, how do we get to, to black folks, right, in the community? And I said, if it's me and, and I'm growing up and when I grew up, the first place I went was to the black church. Mm. And so what did I do? I started to make connections and, and have conversations with black churches around the country um, to have these quote unquote play ball events in, um, in their communities, in their church communities. Um, had had some success there. Those little small communities I talk, I think about the one we started in Queens during the pandemic mm. with, with Greater Allen Cathedral in Queens. Everybody were in masks. We just handed out mass, plastic bats and balls and, and let the kids play baseball and softball in a safe way. And from that um, activation, we started an RBI league. So there was no, there was no, the, the, the community, the church community wasn't engaged at all. Mm -hmm. We just provided bats and balls with, to that community and stayed connected to the community year after year after year. Um, and then from that, the interest was there and now they have a, an RBI uh, league that they're starting. So, you know, little things like that people don't know about, but you know, I know about it, but it's, it doesn't do any good to <laughs> just for me to know about it. I shouldn't say it doesn't do any good because it's always. It, it's, it does. Uh, it does. It, You're it, right. It's impactful, even um, if if folks don't know about it, because right. things are happening. Things are happening and things have been taking place for for a few for a number of years that have been really exciting. And when I hear I mean, to your point, I think earlier you said every opening day we're going to see. 7.5 or 7.7 .7 major yep. players at uh, black players at the major league level. Black people aren't playing, black kids aren't playing baseball. But if you really know what's going on on the ground, like, you know, I feel like I have a good grasp of what's going on on the ground. There's black kids playing the game all over the country. And, and, but we're not, we're not touting it and we're not talking about it enough we're a lot of times relying on that narrative that starts at the first of the year. And then that's carried over by one media outlet to the next. And then all of a sudden that's the narrative, right? You no know, kids aren't black kids aren't playing black kid, black players aren't at the major league level. And then they even compound that when we get to the world series at the, so at the front of the year, you have black kids, black players, 7.7 .7 at the major league level. And at the end of the year, last year, you you end at the World Series and you don't have a black player in the World Series. So the narrative on bookends is we don't have, right? As nope. opposed to what's actually happening on the ground. So um, you know, we have to change that narrative. Um, we have to do more things like like this to 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 make sure folks are being aware. And uh I can tell you some of the programs, I mean when I first started them, or when we I should say we, and I hate to use the word I, but we when we started it. We started some of these programs and we had to beg players to be a part of it, beg coaches to be a part of it. Now I have waiting lists for people to be that want coaches to be a part of it and players and players' families mm -hmm. that want to be a part of these programs. So I, I can see like from where what we started in 15 to where we are in 2023, the the massive change in interest, awareness and um, a hunger to be a part of some of these programs. And um, I just, you know, I'm excited about what lies ahead because I know it's just, we're starting to get in our own internal house at Major League Baseball, get to a place where our marketing and the programs that we're trying to create are on the same page. And if we continue to, to be on the same page, I think that you're gonna see, um, a, a heightened awareness of some of the things that we have in, in, in place. You mentioned it, and, I, and I'm so glad that you did. B, because I always think that there's two parts of these types of efforts. And I think a lot of people, well-intentioned people, are doing the right thing on the ground and focused on the actual task of 
getting more participants, getting more people in the programs, having the that number of three go to 45 and say, our program has touched these, these players and it's really making a difference. And what you said at the end gets me really excited because the other side of this, which I feel like is coming along now, but I think has been part of the challenge probably for the last decade is telling the story and telling the story of these programs almost in a way where we live in a world like it or not that everything is reality tv everything's short everything's youtube and so forth and so when i know things are happening but i i'm not connecting the dots in ways that other sports have because they're telling these stories that that are coming directly to the phone or coming directly to the kids and everybody in a high school or a college is like, Ooh, did you see this? You're starting to see that more and more now. And it's, and it's little things in many ways, but some of it's big production things. Sure. The fact that you put uh, the Andre Dawson classic on MLB network. Now you've got all your, you know, all four colleges and all your people being like, yo, you can see me on, on MLB network now, right. check it out. And they're, they've got young players looking at whether they're cousins, brothers, family, friends, community centers, watching it on TV. We just did on, on our show, on our podcast, we just broke down uh, episode one and we'll break down episode two of the of the uninterrupted documentary that talked about the 2022 draft and mm-hmm. followed players like Tamar Johnson and Justin Crawford. And we're breaking that down like it's a reality show. Sure. Like we're we're breaking and and. I think it's all of those things because I do think we do get kind of caught up. Can't I can't take credit for the uh, for the title. Another gentleman I was talking to told me, and it just made sense. It was kind of like this media industrial complex, where if this is the story at the beginning of the year, that story's not changing because everybody wants to talk about this particular story, and then every network picks up on this story. And what 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 I think needs to happen and you guys are working towards that in many ways and along with other outlets and storytellers is just giving those different stories an opportunity to breathe sure. in that sure. industrial complex so I, I and so now instead of talking about just a raw number here we're talking about what i thought was such an exciting story the the 2022 draft where you know the first what four out of the first four out of first six kids, five kids, African American, yeah. And then and that's not mentioning when you go down to Justin Crawford or or Cam Collier or other yep. players. And I'm so excited to see that some of this stuff is is, is really working. Uh, and we just got to tell those stories in a way that is like we relate to them and we get them, and our community gets them, and we can put them right beside. You know the big the big documentary, whether it's football or basketball and so forth. And I think we're getting there. I think Cheech. we're getting there. And I would say this, Cheech, that you know that that draft class, twenty twenty two, four out of the first five. That's the first time that that happened in the history of the draft. So that's a story. The history. So you know all of the drafts that that have taken place over the years to have four out of the first five African Americans um, go where they went. It's 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 historic and 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 number two to 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 know that like you had some um what should I say some minor touch point with these guys um that helped them along the journey um it is is really exciting because I'm seeing guys that I'm not saying they're going to be four of the first five guys in this 23 draft, but there's a, another group of talented players that will definitely go in the first round that are African-American. And so the whole idea for us is like to keep building on that, building that foundation so that year over year, we have guys that are, you know, elite talent. And a lot of times that elite talent is, is never dif- discovered, right? These kids can play the game, but they just don't get the opportunities to be in this environment or be in draft combine or be um, in some of the major showcases um, that that happened throughout the, the, the summer and, and into the fall. And we try to put those players in 
in that that situation that if you have the talent level, uh, you should have an opportunity to be be seen. Um, we're, we just we're in the process of doing a deal with area codes where we're going to get elite talented players. We're going to get them an opportunity that come through our program to play in area codes. Area codes is probably the biggest high school mm. um, tournament setting that that there is. And we believe that the players that we come across throughout the year and in past years can compete with some of that same talent in the area codes. They just don't have the opportunity. They never got invited to the, the area codes, right? Well, why yeah. did they get it? Why didn't they not get invited? Sometimes it's because of financial resources. Sometimes it's just I haven't been seen. Sometimes um, uh, it's not awareness. But if we get them and put them in that environment, then it's on them to perform. And then you start to put yourself in a situation where now you're on the scouts radar and, you know, hopefully there's some success, you know, from and, that. And the best thing uh, about what you said about that is not only there, there's more tournaments now, there are sure. tournaments that are popping up that are led by, uh, you know, African-Americans shout out minority baseball prospect. I see you um, yeah. and others that are starting to, because once people know it's a thing, you know, this, then everybody wants to get in on this thing. Yeah. And so you're going to start to see it naturally uh, diversify with wonderful organizations that are doing the right thing for the kids as well. Tony, this has been phenomenal. I know you're a very busy man. I'm going to get you out on some, I I got, I got to hit you with the rapid fire. I got to <laughs> hit you with the, I, I hit everybody that comes on the mixtape with the rapid fire. Um, but this is what I don't know. And so you got to tell me, when you were playing, were you a position player or a pitcher? Because that, that leads to my first rapid fire question. <laughs> I was a position player. So um I didn't play at the major league level. Um I was I was a I was a position player. I was a guy that played up the middle. I, I okay I was a catcher, and then I played I, I could run a little bit. So I was I was a catcher. I had a strong arm and then I was a center fielder. So I played up the middle. And okay. I, I, I felt that that was like where um, I had the most impact and impact and, you know, learn to love the game. All right. So are we Don't ready? Me. Here, here we go. If you could face any pitcher living or dead, so you're stepping in the box and you're, you're fa facing off. What pitcher do you face and why? If I could face. Yep. Any, any pitcher pitch living or dead. Uh, <laughs> I would say Bob Gibson. Oh, because because you just you're you're a glutton for punishment. Why why Bob why Bob Gibson? Because you want to compete, and he to me was the ultimate competitor. I had a chance to meet him, and um, folks that I knew that that faced him and that um, were on the other side of the dugout knew it was all business. It was all business and that you had to be prepared um, to face him. And he was um, he wasn't nice. He was nice. He was going to give you his best and you had to be ready. And if you weren't ready, he was going to chew you up. It was over. It was over. And if you embarrassed him, he was going he's going to be wearing one. So, <laughs> uh, Bob Gibson. If you were not working in baseball, what would you be doing? That's a good question. Um, probably would be an educator uh, mm -hmm. um, at some level uh, because I believe that my responsibility as an African-American male is to give back and really impact the next generation. I'm blessed to be able to, to do that in this role but um, if I could help young people uh, become all they can be, that's really what it's all about. At the end of the day, you can, you know, we, it's, we, you know, we, it's that old saying, each one teach one. And if, if I can help someone elevate themselves, um, that's really important to me because you don't just elevate one person you start to elevate a village, right? So um, if I could create that as an educator year over year, you start to impact the city 
a, a community, a city, hopefully a state, hopefully a country, hopefully the world. And um, I really do believe that uh, giving back and, and, and creating opportunities uh, for, for young people is really important because there's no doubt young people are our future. And if I can help them elevate their mentality, their work ethic, their um, ability to do the right thing, their ability to treat people like they want to be treated, like you want to be treated. Then you start talking about a better society in general. And so um, those are the powerful things I think about. So if I wasn't in baseball, um, I'd be an educator of some type of, uh, at some level. And I don't know if that's at, at, at elementary school or if mm -hmm. it's at the college level, but at some level, I would be, I think I'd be an educator. If you were going to recommend any book, any book at all to the Black Baseball Mixtape audience, what book do you recommend? Um, I really do have to think about that one. Okay. Okay. I really do. I think I Barack, come back to it if you need to. Yeah. 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 I have to think about that one. Uh, I'm a big, uh, and Denzel's done some great stuff, you know, that I would, uh, that I would recommend that. And, oh, you know who I, you know, I, w I won't even say it's a book. You know what I would say since the, the world is, is, is uh, in a different, is in a fast mm -hmm. now type of environment now. I would recommend that any young African-American male or female go to YouTube and just spend some time on Maya Angelou clips. Okay. Spend That's a good one. That's a good one. She um, spent some time on just her clips because wisdom um, and the wisdom and, and the way she delivers is is so powerful, mm -hmm. uh, so powerful. I was I was just recently I was driving. I had about an hour drive, and I just repeated a, a bunch of different mm -hmm. interviews that she had done in the past. And it's it's like so powerful in the way she delivers it. It uh, it's impactful. It made me think about uh, why we do what we do. I like it. I like it. And <laughs> and you are you are exactly right in regards to just the delivery method of a Maya no Angelou. Doubt. I no would, I would also uh, for people that are listening. If you're gonna do you're gonna do those clips, I, I suggest you highly recommend you do them. There are some Nikki Giovanni. Yeah. Uh if there's some Nikki Giovanni, yeah. Yeah. even Nikki Nikki Giovanni, James Baldwin conversations yeah. that are just mixtape audience, you'll thank us later for that. Those are very great. <laughs> you'll think, no doubt you will thank us later. Last no. la, last two ones, uh, Mr. Regans, I'm gonna get you out of here. I'm going to reverse the order and what I thought I would do because I, I want to ask the last question last. Um, you're a very busy man. How do you take time away from the game? How do you balance? How do you recharge? I think it's very important. You know, balance is important for me. Um, I um, started golfing about Two years ago, so <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing because that. anybody that plays golf understands that that you you're you're asking for more pain in this sense. Definitely, but some of the some of the places that I've been able to golf, um, and some of the environments, oh, the oh wow, scenery, the um, uh, it's definitely a frustrating game, but <laughs> the, the the environment, the atmosphere, you know, the smell of the grass, the grass smell of the grass reminds me of baseball. Mm -hmm. Um, but I try to golf every once in a while. I don't get a chance to do it. Uh, spend a lot of time with my family when I'm not, uh, not working. Um, that's really what's most important My my family. And, and, um, uh, I, I coach my boys in, in basketball and, and, and baseball, you know, when I have, a, when I have a chance, I, I miss some games because of, but work, sure. but, but I try to make sure I'm present for that. 
And then one of the, the second thing that really is important, I'm trying to prepare them too, like for what lies ahead. Um, and sometimes it's not always like in your face stuff. It's like, I let them watch me work. Mm. Let them sometimes hear conversations that I have from a management standpoint. Um, and they, they all know uh, that, you know, education is, is important. So we really talk with a lot about education and what that means, because without an, ele- an education, your chances of uh, success, you know, they, they, they become um, compromised a bit. So I think that extremely you have to be uh, some, some folks don't, you know, didn't, didn't go to college and, and it had success, but by and large, if you go to, you know, you gotta, you need to go to college and, and experience that. And so they know how important um, education is to me. All my kids, uh, I think two of the, two of them have, you know, straight A's and then uh, one of them, I think had one B or maybe two B's, but they, uh, they're pretty good students, which is, you know, really important to me. We're going to end on this one because I have so many questions, let alone who would you want to play golf with? I'm not going to ask, but I, love, I got so many questions. The last one, though, I always ask um, people on the show, would they rather be the GM of a club or commissioner of baseball? And they have to tell me b- between those two, you're going to it's kind of harder for you because you've been GM of a club. You work really close to the commissioner of baseball. So I'm just going to ask you very quickly. We'll get out of here. What job is harder, GM or commissioner? Uh, Well, I can tell you that since I've been a a GM and now I've been around the commissioner a lot, uh, you know, we we have a minute his weekly staff meeting. And I see some of the, the decisions that he has to make. The commissioner's job is definitely much, much harder. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. This is, yeah, I don't, don't want to go into details. I don't want you to get in any trouble because <laughs> I think one day, look, one day, and I look, I wish great health and much success to Commissioner Manford, but I also say if there's always these short lists that I think of and you and, and Tony Regans would be on that short list as possibly a history-making commissioner of baseball as well. So I'm going to leave it there. I said it. You didn't. I would let me just say this, and yes, this is my boss, so I would just say this. This is one of the smartest guys I've ever been around. Um, it, and you know, sometimes he gets some negative press, and I think all the commissioners do. Yep. Uh, but one of the smartest guys I've ever been around uh, to be able to, to to watch him work and do what he does, and 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 make the decisions that he has to make is phenomenal. And it's uh, every day. It's every day. I'll go a step further um, in the sense of, and I know I'm only, I never met the man, don't, you know, only seen what I've seen as a fan of baseball. I think when it's all said and done, based off of the people like you and what your team is doing um, and the stuff that we just talked about in this, in, in this conversation that we've had, I think he will, I don't know if he'll get credit for it, but when, when it's all said and done, he will go down as one of the more proactive, progressive, uh, inclusive, maybe the most commissioners of all time when it comes to increasing participation uh for for our community in the game i think he i think he's got whatever he's got in him and i don't know him but whatever he's got in him he's got it in an understanding of what how important it is well and not just in my world uh, you had tyrone brooks on your uh, i did you had him on your on your podcast tyrone's world michael hill's world you're i think you're exactly right people just don't know when and I talked to our, our our communications folks about putting a list, just collecting a list of everything that we have going on. This list is massive in a lot of different lanes, right? But we have to do a better job of letting people know this is exactly what's happening at the commissioners often in, in, in and in baseball, because you know it's life changing, it's generation changing stuff that's happening, man. And uh, uh, I, I'm glad to be a part of it. I couldn't agree more. Not only are you a part of it, you're very modest to that. You are you are front and center of it, Mr. Regans. And I wish you tremendous, tremendous success in the next couple of weeks as Team USA goes and <laughs> takes care of business. But also in the mission that you're doing is so critical. It's so important that we have these conversations. People know all the things that you're doing and how we can follow it. So 
whenever, look, whenever you have time in the future, there's all of these things that are always happening. Come back on the mixtape anytime you are. Uh, you've made my you made my day, week, month. It has really been an honor. Well, Cheats, I'll be happy to come back next time. I'm going a, I'm to a hunt you down because... Uh... <laughs> We, we're we doing great things. things we're doing great it. things with the mixtape. Yeah, it's no a, who knows? Who knows what'll happen? Thank no you, doubt. Mr. Regans. Everybody go follow MLB Develops. Follow obviously uh Tony Regans if, if you can. It is it is uh they're doing some great things and, and it's just been a pleasure. So make sure you share it, like it, subscribe it. Until next time, we see it.